Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Douglas with another armchair vacation in America. If the airplane had been invented in the 16th century, here is what the first settlers to the Carolinas might have seen. A land flat but often fertile, a wilderness rich in water and woodland, a vast region having natural access to the mighty Atlantic. The Spaniards were the first to discover and settle South Carolina back in the early 1500s. The permanent settlers, the English colonials, did not arrive until a century and a half later. But today is what counts from the vacationer's viewpoint. What are the worthwhile things to see and do in this one of the original 13 states? Well, the camera will be our guide as we search for the answers. This, ladies and gentlemen, is your armchair vacation and mine too, the Carolinas South. In 1680, Charleston became the first major settlement in what is now South Carolina. So naturally, this fabulous Atlantic seaport is the state's oldest and perhaps most charming city. Charleston's main characteristic, however, is that the city is a composite picture of all the major events in the history of the state. In Marion Square, for example, Charleston honors the great South Carolinian John Calhoun, the articulate, formidable champion of states' rights and the slave issue. Calhoun studied law in Charleston, and he is buried on the site of St. Philip's Episcopal Church. Slaves were bought and sold in this slave mart, now a museum and gift shop, and the old powder magazine used as a munition storehouse during the Revolution is the oldest public building in the city. You'll find another first at the corner of Meeting and Chalmers Streets, the first fireproof building in the USA. Today, it houses the South Carolina Historical Society. Well, here are more firsts. The first Chamber of Commerce organization in the U.S., founded in 1773. The Dock Street Theater, first building in America designed solely for theatrical purposes. And finally, the St. John Hotel, Charleston's oldest and indeed only antebellum hotel. And from this roof, General Robert E. Lee watched in anguish as fire laid waste much of the city in 1861. These street signs introduce us to Charleston's Rainbow Row, so named because of the beautiful, soft, pastel colors of the houses and buildings, predominantly blues, pinks, and yellows. St. Michael's in the heart of the city is also a famous landmark. Washington and Lafayette worshiped here, and its bells, through a series of events, have crossed the Atlantic five times. Another interesting, as well as attractive churches, is the French Huguenot Church, the last remaining Huguenot house of worship in the U.S. For 150 years, services were conducted in French, but English is now also used. It's Friday afternoon at the Citadel in Charleston, the Citadel, one of the world's great military colleges. The 2,000 cadets are on parade, honoring General Mark Clark of World War II fame, and for quite a few years, the head of the Citadel. After dress parade, the visitor is invited to tour the college. Of special interest is the stunning monument to His Majesty's ship Seraph, the submarine that landed General Clark and his staff on the coast of Africa for the historic rendezvous with leaders of the French forces. The year was 1942. The chapel at the Citadel is large, but not particularly distinctive. However, this admonition is one we'll not soon forget. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Once through the entrance gate, the Citadel will remind you of West Point.
This is Charleston's most sacred and historically important landmark. This is Fort Sumter guarding the mouth of the harbor. On the morning of April 12, 1861, this federal installation was bombarded by Confederate batteries in the Charleston area. And this bombardment signaled the beginning of the war between the states. Today, Fort Sumter is a national monument, and I'm happy to report that tens of thousands of school children and an even greater number of vacationers visit this proud shrine each year. These harbor excursion boats will take you from the city to the fort in a matter of minutes. Fort Sumter is more than a tourist attraction. It is a tremendous emotional experience, one you'll remember long after your visit. All along the Carolina coastline, you'll envy people enjoying the sun while swinging lazily in a rope hammock. Well, these hammocks are made by the weavers. That's the family name, appropriately enough. And you'll find the weavers on Pauley Island, about 75 miles north of Charleston. These Pauley Island hammocks are hand-woven from high-grade cotton twill cordage and use aged oak stretchers to stabilize the width of the hammocks. The prices were a most pleasant surprise, ranging from $15 to $30 for the largest size, which was about 14 and a half feet overall. The advertising brochure says, you're in for some of the laziest, easiest hours ever whiled away, and you'd better believe it. Driving north again, we stopped at Brook Green Gardens a few miles from Polly's Island. At the entrance, your attention will be arrested by this heroic group in aluminum, Fighting Stallions, one of the largest castings in this material ever attempted. Brook Green is the dream come true of Mr. and Mrs. Archer M. Huntington, a dream that became reality in 1931. Now, in a nutshell, Brook Green accents the beauty of nature with the beauty of man's creative genius. There are dozens, perhaps hundreds, of sculptures spotlighting the landscape works of stone and bronze that exhilarate the eye. I don't know the size of Brook Green, but it is enormous, and I do know that you and I could not walk every acre in a single day. Well, that's not important. What is important is the ecstasy you will feel just being here at Brook Green. While we were here, one woman visitor said, well, I guess this is what heaven would look like if landscaped by mortal man. She spoke for all of us and all who have taken the time to enjoy a garden that is unique among America's great gardens. Myrtle Beach is 20 miles from Brook Green and like the gardens and Pauley's Island, the beach is located on Highway 17, which hugs much of the South Carolina coastline. That's Highway 17 on the coast. Myrtle Beach reminds me of California and Florida rolled into one. Now the Dunes Country Club is at Myrtle Beach and the February 22, 1965 issue of Sports Illustrated magazine labeled the Dunes 13th hole one of the most difficult par five holes in the country. Listen to the club pro, Jimmy D'Angelo. We at the Dunes Club are very proud of having our 13th hole selected as one of the outstanding holes in the country. Robert Trent Jones, the well-known architect who designed our course, did an outstanding job on this hole and it is recognized by all types of golfers in the country as the finest par five hole they've ever played. Let me show you the 13th hole, Jack. The 13th hole is a left to right hole which is referred to as a dog leg. We like to call it a fish hook hole, because actually you are driving away from the hole from the tee. In order to arrive at the correct position, I am using a driver and attempting to fade it slightly. Now to make certain that I clear Singleton Lake 
which, by the way, has several alligators in it, I have selected a three wood. This is all I need to put me in position to hit into the green. My third shot will be played with an eight iron. In order to clear the trap and stopping the ball as closely as possible to the hole, which today is located in the valley. I have a 15 foot putt, a terrific right to left roll and downhill. I shall attempt now to put it in the hole for a birdie, but making sure that I do not go too far beyond. Stopping the ball close enough so that my par is insured. While Jimmy taps in for his par, here's some info for you golfers. The Dunes is a private club, but extends privileges to people staying at the major Myrtle Beach hotels. The city of Conway is just a few miles inland from Myrtle Beach. The localites are proud of the fact that Robert Mills, who designed the Washington Monument, also designed the Conway City Hall. But we were more interested in the old institution known as Joglin. Now in the plantation days, the Joglin board was much like a swing. After dinner, entire families would sit on the board and just joggle. And many a plantation mammy joggled the master's children to sleep on joggling boards similar to this. So throughout the Carolinas, you're going to be invited to set a spell and joggle. And frankly, I think you'll like it. The Waccamaw River in Conway is another delightful form of escapism. It offers boating and swimming, fishing, and a lot of greenery. In other words, it beats working and maybe even joggling. Speaking of fishing, you anglers should try Lake Moultrie, farther south and slightly west of Conway and closer to Charleston. Moultrie is noted for its landlocked striped bass, a saltwater fish that has adapted itself to this particular body of fresh water. We tried to get more information for you, but you know, fishermen everywhere are alike. Give them a rod and they're in a world of their own. Well, we don't like to bother people, so we got what information and pictures we could and tiptoed away. Aiken, near the Georgia border, is the horse center of South Carolina, and some of the country's top breeding farms are located in the Aiken area. If you like horseback riding, Aiken was made to order. You shouldn't miss it. And here, Mr. Walter Newman, a riding instructor and trainer, escorts several guests on a jaunt over the bridle paths, some of the most peaceful and pleasant riding trails you'd ever hope to see. The sign is plain enough, entrance, famous view. The place is Caesar's Head in the northern part of the state, not far from the border of Tennessee. Mounting the observation tower, you look out on the high country, elevation over 3,000 feet, a small section of Appalachia. Now, in recent years, Appalachia and poverty have become somewhat synonymous, but this bountiful land is far from poor. As far as the eye can see, this is indeed America the Beautiful. This unusual formation is known as Dog Rock, shaped by time and the elements to resemble the head of a dog. Caesar's head, a sample of nature's handiwork in the Carolinas South. Beaufort is pronounced Boofer, the second oldest town in South Carolina. Now, in the travel brochures, Boofer's claim to fame is St. Helena's Episcopal Church, the oldest Episcopal church in the 50 states. But these shacks and bungalows tell a story the brochures bypass. The doors and shutters are painted blue 
to keep out the evil spirit, known hereabouts as the Platai. That's P-L-A-T, Platai. Yes, and even newer homes obey the superstition of the Platai. The door frames are painted blue. However, don't be deceived by a few localized superstitions. South Carolina is neither backwoods nor backward. We're flying now from Charleston to Columbia, the state capital and the state's largest city in terms of population. In Columbia, you may wish to see the boyhood home of Woodrow Wilson, America's World War president and that passionate disciple of peace. The University of South Carolina. The Lancaster Jail, built in 1823 and still in use today and the Presbyterian Church used to quarter General Sherman's horses during you know which war. And P.S. Sherman is not a nice word hereabouts, so may I suggest we skip it and let's move on. And don't let these signs fool you, we're still in South Carolina, passing three towns named after Scandinavian countries. The Iris Festival at Sumter, not to be confused with Fort Sumter, takes place during the first nine days of May. Now this means that people who can only vacation during the summer miss out on this and other colorful treats of the festival. Well, let's hope they change the date because frankly, nobody pays too much attention to the Iris or any other flower for that matter. These are the flowers they've come to see, some of the loveliest beauty queens in the land, and all are southern bells. On the day that Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, Sumter, South Carolina was the scene of one of the last battles of that epic war. The battle took place at Dingles Mill, three miles from town, when 158 Confederates stopped for several hours almost 3,000 Union troops. This reenactment is an annual observance at Sumter, and it's one of the best reenactments we've seen anywhere in the States. Not because it's big, which it isn't, but because it is so completely authentic. For example, the Sumterites have resisted the temptation to make their Confederates look like Hollywood movie stars. They are young, but old before their time. They are tired and tattered, pounded to pieces by four years of bloody war. News of Lee's surrender did not reach Sumter for two weeks. And so, on the day that the war had officially ended, men died at a place called Dingle's Mill. To those of us who visit here, there is no north, no south, no question of who won or lost. For Dingle's Mill, like the Alamo, belongs to all of us, to all who place a premium on valor and raw courage, 158 against almost 3,000. This is part of a beautiful island, Hilton Head, south of Charleston and near the Georgia boundary line. Yes, Hilton Head also has memories of the Great War. Here was fought the Battle of Port Royal, which gave the North the key base from which to operate the naval blockade that ultimately strangled the Southern cause. But that was many, many yesterdays ago. Today, Hilton Island is pure paradise for the vacationer. And say, have you ever seen a driftwood tree as big and as interesting as this one? If an artist painted it, we probably wouldn't believe it. There's a real touch of excitement at the Sea Pines Golf Course. Time and again, you'll have to hit over water, and you'd better make it or forget it, because the ponds and lagoons are stocked with alligators. We checked in at the William Hilton Inn, which incidentally has an excellent gift shop, a shop that specializes in the unusual. Here's an example, a Confederate music box which plays Dixie.
showing no favoritism, the inn offers equal time to a Union soldier and the battle hymn of the Republic. The Adventure Inn is another of many first-rate inns and motels on Hilton Island, and you couldn't ask for a better setting with the Atlantic for a background. Cycling is the island's favorite means of transportation as well as a sport. You rent a bike and head for the beach, and you'll see whole families pedaling along the beachfront, and surprisingly, the tires do not sink into the sand. Walter Greer is a well-known name on Hilton Island where he is referred to as the man that got away, a man who gave up a share of a successful company founded by himself and his brothers, a man who traded security for the insecure life of an artist. The decision wasn't easy. He was in his late 30s, married and the father of three children but he wanted desperately to paint, and here on Hilton Island, he found the variety of subjects he liked painting, mostly landscapes, but also unusual portraiture. He is adept in realism, and equally at home in abstract impressionism. When Greer isn't exhibiting his work around the country, he likes to teach vacationers like ourselves who have a yen to dabble. So look him up on Hilton Island, Walter Greer. Well, this night would be our last on the island, and we spent most of it on a cookout at the Hilton Inn. The food, excellent by the way, had been prepared in advance and was served buffet style. We weren't exactly roughing it, but after weeks of being served at a table at one restaurant after another, it was nice to just fill a plate and find a seat on the ground by the huge fire pit. It was kind of romantic, certainly nostalgic, and a perfect ending of our visit to the Carolinas South. Footstep across the border from South to North Carolina, but as these few brief preview scenes indicate, North Carolina has many attractions of its own, separate from its sister state. Look for it soon, the Carolinas North on America.